Our first scripture reading this morning, our Old Testament lesson, is from 2 Samuel 6, verses 6 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there because he had reached out his hand to the ark, and he died there beside the ark of God. David was angry because the Lord had burst forth with an outburst against Uzzah, so that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day. He said, how can the ark of the Lord come into my care? So David was unwilling to take the ark of the Lord into his care in the city of David. Instead, David took, David took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. It was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David, David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And the second lesson on this Trinity Sunday in the year of our Lord, 2020, is in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 28, beginning at 16, and we'll be hearing God's word from the message today. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word and silence in us any voice but your own that hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name. We are baptized in a name, immersed into an identity. Here's the thing. Baptism is not optional. It will happen whether we like it or not, actually whether we know it or not, which is why it's important that we're here together today paying attention. Choosing the name to which our baptism joins us is of great, even grave consequence. Here's what I mean. We live in a world that is altogether eager to identify us and is only too happy to give us a name if we opt out of that decision for ourselves or if we're simply sleepwalking 
or not paying attention. The most common names given to us are not, it turns out, on the list of this year's most popular baby names like Olivia, uh, Noah, or Emma. Instead, today's culture would love for us to answer to the Trinitarian names of consumption or consumer, producer, and acquirer. We go by various aliases as well, nicknames like shopper, employee, uh, taxpayer, but whatever it is, it refers to us in these deep personalized terms of resources, what the world can get from us and what it can get out of us. I call it cultural baptism. And if you accept these names, if you succumb to those definitions, you will be reduced from the humanity for which you were created. Here's the holy alternative, which is closely related to what has become my primary pastoral desire for you, to be baptized in God's name and then to live out of that identity. Father, Son, Spirit. You can think of it as a simple two-step dance in which each step takes a turn. It's so easy. Anyone can do it. Step one, turn from. Before we can fully say yes to anything or anyone, we first have to say no. I just noticed this this week, that the first of the Ten Commandments reflects this. Do you remember how it goes? You shall have no other gods besides me. The world has a vast inventory of contenders competing for our affections and our loyalty. Before we can commit our hearts to Jesus, we must first slam a lot of doors in the face of whatever else it might be that is courting our affection and ultimate allegiance. Rejection is the necessary precursor to acceptance. The first word in baptism is no. We say no to sin, we say no to evil, we say no to anything that is hostile to the way of God. And part of saying no involves saying no to what is wrong in the world. It takes the form of both renunciation and denunciation. Renunciation is the rejection of anything that is wrong. Things like lies or violence or racism or exploitation of vulnerable people. It comes from a Latin word which actually means to protest against. Some of you have been getting pretty good at it some good practice, protest, renounce. And then denunciation is similar and equally important. It involves the public condemnation of someone or something. It's naming the behaviors and the systems of injustice. It requires of us that we use our voices as agents for truth and goodness by calling out anything that is not true or good. Renunciation and denunciation. I want to point out <clears throat> that uh, engaging in these acts is not impolite, and it is not in any way unchristian. Some of us are timid about this because we don't want to sound hypocritical or self-righteous, or if you're like me, you don't want to offend people or risk doing damage to your relationships. And so I'm here today to remind you of what I need to remind myself. We're all flawed. We're all falling short of the glory of God, which means that we're bound to do this imperfectly. But perfection is not the goal in either who we are or how we go about doing this. D 
denouncing that which is contrary to the gospel is priestly and prophetic work of the highest and holiest order. And if you identify among the baptized, it's really not optional work. It's what our baptism demands of us. We are naysayers first, renouncing and denouncing the things to which God says no. That's the essence of step one, turn from. Step two, turn toward. You'll be happy to hear that this is the easier of the two steps. In it, we turn toward the God who in Christ invites us to enter a divine embrace, to be restored in our relationship with our maker and to enjoy fellowship with a communion of saints, those people both dead and alive who make up the body of Christ. The reason we call it good news is because it comes with the happy realization that we are incapable of running our lives by ourselves and that's not what we were designed to do. And so it involves this kind of big sigh of assent, uh, relinquishment, surrender, a yes to God's yes, allowing Christ to inhabit our lives and to give him the freedom, get this, to live his life through us. In other words, forget about trying to do what Jesus would do. Just let him manifest his life in you. That's what it means to be a Christian, a little Christ. He lives in you. <clears throat> a huge part of this dance is that it turns us toward a new identity. And that identity orients us for a new life of faith, a new way of being in this world. I know that you've been taught, as I have, to believe that your value as a person lies in how much you can consume and produce and acquire. Those are big, ugly lies, distortions, and I urge you to reject them all. Instead, this is the holy litany, the, the identity for those who have been baptized in the name. This is what's most true about you. You are a child of God. You have been made a permanent citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You are absolutely precious. You're holy and you are beloved, claimed, marked, sealed as God's own for all eternity. And there's not a single thing in heaven or on earth or in hell itself that can separate you from the great love that God has for you in Christ Jesus. Say yes to that. These are the sacred movements of the baptized life, not once in time, but over the course of a lifetime. This is the sacramental dance into which we are being called. Like all dance moves, we keep practicing them until they flow naturally as part of the choreography of our lives. It's actually a little funny that I'm talking this way because I can't dance at all. I would never be confused with Fred Astaire. I mean, I can dad dance with the best of them, doing my silly moves with my kids when no one else is looking, but trust me when I tell you that you would not want me to be a contestant on Dancing with the Stars. It would be an exercise in awkward, and you would simply be embarrassed to know me. Which is weird, really, because if you hang around children long enough, you'll see that it's almost universally true that when you turn on the music, they naturally move quite without any instruction or encouragement. They just get their groove on. It seems children, we are born to dance. I assume that was true for me, um, but since I don't have any memories of childhood dance parties, it seems that I unlearned it pretty early in my life. 
David was among one of the fortunate ones who never stopped dancing, and the Bible describes occasions when he allowed his body to move with his joy. Brenna read part of one of those stories to help remind us of the day when the ark of God was brought into David's possession. The ark, as you may recall, was thought to represent God's very presence. It was this chest-like container which held the Ten Commandments um, and, and came to be associated with the very presence of God. And so when it was brought to David, he was overcome with joy, and the text says he danced before the Lord with all his might. <laughs> After spending a good bit of my life going to school, I've discovered that there are some things we need to unlearn, and there are some things we need to relearn. For example, we need to unlearn such things as racial prejudices. I'm still in this process because I grew up south of the Mason-Dixon line in the 1960s, and I heard and saw some things that taught me to think differently about the value of black lives. But there was one key unlearning moment for me. I was taking a seminary course in the ethics of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I just was immersed in his writings and in the world of that time in the civil rights movement. And as a result, I became uncomfortably aware of the seeds of racism that had been sown in me because of the county I was raised in in that time in history. Assumptions and prejudices that had been allowed to linger unchecked for far too long were uncovered. And I was horrified at what I saw in myself. I came under the spell of deep conviction and I confessed my sins to my professor. Dr. Peter Paris wasn't just an eminent Princeton scholar, but a pastor. As a representative of the black community and as a pastor, he listened to me, he heard me, and then he issued an assurance of pardon. He forgave me. I still have a good bit of unlearning to do, but that's what got me started. There are also some things that we need to relearn because we are prone to forget. On the Greek Orthodox side of the church's genealogical tree, there is an understanding of the Trinity which they describe with the word perichoresis or circle dance. That is to say, this three in one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, are engaged in an intimately close relationship that resembles the movements of a dance. It's a dance that we are invited to join and participate in by being in that joyful communion with God and by becoming participants in the ongoing work of God. I don't know if this is what they had in mind, but for me, perichoresis evokes this image of the three members of the Trinity holding hands moving together in a circle, and then every once in a while, dropping their hands and inviting others to come inside, to be enfolded inside that relationship and that love, and then holding hands again, and the circle expands and expands and gets bigger. But there are in this life things that threaten or actually cause us to step out of that dance with the triune God, we experience pain or loss that can make us stumble, disrupt our relationships both with God and with one another. Somebody steps on our toes, we trip and fall. We decide we're just not up for it and we decide to sit this one out. I, I wonder, how will history describe the year of our Lord, 2020? A world that was redefined by a global pandemic 
a planet where it is no longer possible to deny climate change, a world that has been fraught with racial divides so deep and wide as the Grand Canyon itself, across which a bridge was thought to be an engineering impossibility, all of which leads to this descent into chaos, disorder, a big hot mess. And that is the possible outcome as the historians reflect back on this time. It might even be the plausible one But there is an alternative, because we always have a choice. These are days, I believe, that are inviting us. They're urging us. My God, they're begging us to come to our senses, to repent of our waywardness, our racism, our mean spirits, This is a defining moment in world history for us to get in sync with the divine rhythms, to come into step with the movements of God, to cooperate with all the holy energies of redemption and healing, to dance with all our might. Will you join this dance? It's really simple. It's not at all easy. Take the first step by turning from sin and renouncing and denouncing all the evil in this world, including the evil that yet resides in your heart. I'll do it with you. Take the second step and turn to Jesus Christ, trusting him with your very life. Again, I'll do it with you. While we're at it, let's make it a waltz and take the third step by saying yes to the invitation to join Jesus for a meal because he's the Lord of this dance and he's the host of the banquet. Let's do this together as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.